If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, malaria is probably the most important parasitic disease affecting humans. Uh, the parasite belongs to the class Sporozoa and the genus Plasmodium, a name which essentially means multinucleated mass. Now, there are scores of named parasites, Plasmodium species, which infect various species of vertebrates. Four species are considered true parasites of humans, as they utilize humans almost exclusively as a natural intermediate host. And those are Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, and Plasmodium malariae. In addition, Plasmodium nolisi, a type of malaria that naturally infects macaques in Southeast Asia, also infects humans, causing malaria that is transmitted from animal to human. Just a few general facts about the malarial parasites. All Plasmodia are pigment producers. All Plasmodia are amoeboid, some more than others. All Plasmodia have an asexual cycle in the vertebrate host, and they all have a sexual cycle in the invertebrate host, which of course is the mosquito. Uh, today we're going to do some general discussion about malaria, and we're going to start with some specifics later on in the podcast about Plasmodium vivax. Now, joining me for the discussion is parasitology teacher and author, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome back to the program. Hi, happy to be here. Okay, well, let's start out with the geographic distribution of malaria species that affect humans. Uh, where is malaria found? Sure. Malaria is mostly known for being present in the tropics. So we see it in Central America, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and South Pacific Islands, generally in that area of the world. But most people tend to think that malaria is its distribution is limited by climate. In fact, its distribution is limited more by lifestyle and the ability to protect yourself from mosquito bites. So malaria used to be much more widespread. We used to see it even in southern Canada and in Siberia and in places of the world, southern England, where you really wouldn't expect to find malaria. And it's only retreated from those areas because People's standard of living has gone up, and we perhaps don't live as closely with animals and, you know, with nature as we once did. So it's not so much a climatic thing, but it's more of a disease of poverty like so many parasites. Now, how common is it? What's, what's the case count worldwide? Uh, we're talking about millions of people at risk, or billions of people even in the world with uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of cases each year if we take in and consider all of the different species of malaria. It's difficult to sort them out in terms of numbers. Uh, the most serious one would be Plasmodium falciparum, and so most of the statistics that you see would refer to that, and perhaps sometimes adding in Vivax, which was the one we were going to focus on tonight. So it's hard to separate them out, but of all of the species, certainly billions at risk. Now, each malarial species has four distinct stages of morphology. Um, Rosemary, can you discuss what these are? Yes, as you mentioned in your introduction, malaria has a life cycle that involves both mosquitoes and people. So when the mosquito bites, we have the sporozoia being introduced to the human bloodstream. And that stage of the parasite very quickly moves to the liver. So there's a stage that lives in the liver and multiplies in liver cells. 
um, eventually destroying those cells and being released into the bloodstream. And then we have that stage invades the red blood cell in the development of what we call merozoites, which multiply in the red blood cell and eventually destroy it and burst out of the red cell, reinvade new red cells. These are very tiny parasitic forms, and you can see them um, sometimes in you know significant numbers inside a red cell. As each one invades the red cell, it becomes, it starts to grow and develop as a individual parasite and we get the development of what's often referred to as signet ring or the very, very early stage of the parasite. These become more amoeboid, more trophozoite-like, like little amoebas that live inside the cell. And eventually, after a number of cycles of this, you get the development of the gametocyte, which is then the male or female or sexual stage of the parasite. And it's that stage that is ingested by the mosquito when it bites. And then in the mosquito, it has its own little stage of life cycle, which is the, the sexual stage of reproduction, the production eventually of those sporozoites, which will get injected into the next human host. So it's quite a complicated life cycle. And if anyone's familiar with the life cycle of things like cryptosporidium, it's somewhat similar, but happening in two different hosts instead of just one. Now, how is malaria transmitted to people? Through the bite of a mosquito, usually. That is the most common way that malaria gets, uh, that a person contracts malaria, through the bite of a mosquito. And um, is there any human-to-human -human transmission? Yes, although it's unusual. Uh, mother to uh, a pregnant woman to unborn baby, and also through, of course, blood transfusions and that sort of thing. Now, the pathology of malaria differs somewhat based on species. Um, are there some general signs and symptoms true for all the human species? Yes, I think the most famous and well-known symptom of malaria is a sort of a, a recurring fever, which will recur at a, in a, within a specific time period. So, for instance, with Plasmodium vivax, it's usually a 48-hour fever cycle. So every 48 hours, your fever will spike. And that is preceded by chills and shakes and, you know, a, a feeling of, of, you know, bad illness and afterwards, after that's all over exhaustion. So uh, if you look in the textbooks, you'll see each of the species will be described as having a particular fever cycle, and that's a clue as to what species you're dealing with, although usually nowadays we have better methods of uh, determining which species is causing the illness. Okay, so let's switch gears to uh, the specifics about Plasmodium vivax, uh, today's mm -hmm. featured malaria species. And I believe this is the most common species, but it's not the most pathogenic. Um, Rosemary, can you talk specifically about the pathology of vivax malaria? Yes. Vivax malaria causes that recurring fever cycle, but it also has some interesting features in that you could be infected with this species of malaria for months, even perhaps up to a year or more, and, and not really know that you have it. So if you pick it up in some part of the world away from home and come back, you could not realize that you're infected with the parasite until some time after. And it can actually recur for years and years and years at, uh, you know, at, after periods of time of apparent health. And that's because the parasite can hide in your liver and then recur after periods of time. So that's one of the things about plasmodium vivax, which makes it rather difficult. It has that recurring fever cycle when you're actually, um, when you're actually having symptoms of it. It's rarely fatal, but it certainly can be quite debilitating. So it could prevent you from, you know, uh, it could affect your ability to work over the long term, sort of a chronic illness more than a, more than an acute one. Right, and the fact that it, it can relapse also. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's also in recent years some reports in the literature that it may be, some strains of it may be becoming more severe and more dangerous, but it's not really clear why that's happening. Okay, so how is malaria diagnosed, any, any of the species? 
Uh, yeah, the classic way is to do thick and thin blood smears. So by a thick smear, I mean several drops of blood in which the red cells have been destroyed. So you can see the parasites within that small area on the smear, but also a thin smear where the red cells are intact and we see the typical morphology of the parasite inside the red cell. And these different species of malaria can look quite different. They have typical appearances within a red cell and there are features that we can look for that help us to identify the species. Right, and that really goes right into my next question. Uh, Rosemary, what are some of the key morphologies you'll see microscopically with Plasmodium vivax? Key for a Plasmodium vivax is that you tend to see a number of different stages of the life cycle within red cells. So not just the early stage or just the late, but you see the different stages, all of the uh, the schizont where the parasite is dividing the gametocyte, which I, I mentioned was the sexual stage, the trophozoic stage, which tends to be very amoeboid and spreading, and something called shifter's dots, which appear in the red cells. They're like little red speckles in the red cells, which are quite characteristic of, of vivax and one of the other species as well, but particularly vivax because right. it's one of the most common. And uh, how about the treatment regimen for plasmodium vivax? So treatment of the plasmodium species is quite complicated, and it depends on which part of the world you were exposed in, what the... Uh, what the resistance patterns to antibiotics there are and whether or not you've been on a prophylactic drug to prevent um, infection to begin with. So there's a lot of different things that have to be taken into consideration. Perhaps the easiest answer is primaquine, but like I said, there's a lot of things to think about be before a physician would decide on a treatment. Right. Now, if someone, and you mentioned travel, if someone is traveling to a malaria endemic part of the world, what advice would you have for them? The first thing to do, of course, is to find out whether there is a risk of contracting malaria in the place that you're going. And the CDC has a great reference for that. I think it's called the Yellow Book or something like that, mm -hmm. which tells you about, gives you specific information about what the risks are in the place that you're traveling to and what the recommended um, prophylactic drug for malaria would be. So if there's a risk where you're traveling, then you should be on some kind of prophylactic prophylaxis before you go. And then, um, of course, avoiding mosquito bites. And from my own experience, I will say that although that might sound relatively easy, it really isn't. You'd be really surprised when I traveled in Thailand, and we landed in Bangkok, and I thought, well, I'm not going to have to worry about mosquitoes here. And I actually saw one in the taxi on the way from the airport. So, And local people often say, oh, there are no mosquitoes. So you don't have to worry. But there are mosquitoes. You can see them. So you always have to be on the lookout and trying to avoid being bitten in the first place. And that's the best way to avoid catching malaria. The other thing I found was that a lot of places where people are, they're quite blasé about it and they don't worry about whether they have screens on their windows and whether there's any way for a mosquito to get into your sleeping quarters. When actually, there are lots of ways. So traveling with a mosquito bed net is a great idea. They're quite light, they pack small, and you can enclose your bed with a nice mosquito bed net to protect you while you're sleeping. Right, and you can get those impregnated with uh, anti-malarial chemicals. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. And yeah. another thing concerning travel, you can always, you know, talk to your personal physician or even better, go to a travel health clinic and tell, tell yeah, them where you're that's going. Right. Yeah. And they'll be able to sp sure. you know, specifically figure out what you need. Um, yeah, that's right. Rosemary, piggybacking on malaria prevention, is there a malaria vaccine? And if not, how come? Well, whole books have written, been written about it, and many people have spent you know, lifetimes of research trying to develop a malaria vaccine. But so far, nobody has managed to develop something, anything you know, that's really effective. In the last few years, I've heard about some relatively successful trials, but it still sounds like the percentage of people who respond with a good immune uh, response to it is not that great. So this is a parasite that 
seems to be always one step ahead of us. As soon as we can develop an anti-malarial or a vaccine against it, it evolves and those things are no longer effective. So it's always a, a game of catch-up for humans. And to close, uh, Rosemary, do you have any interesting stories that you want to share about Plasmodium vivax? Well, there's one that's really old that I just love. It comes to us from the 1800s before we really knew that what was causing malaria. They knew about the disease, but they didn't know what caused it. And there was a, a murder case reported in the literature where four men invaded a sort of a corner store and they unfortunately bludgeoned the storekeeper to death. And ultimately, one of the pieces of evidence that convicted them was that it was known that this storekeeper had malaria, and it was probably Vivax, almost certainly Vivax. This was in uh, Louisiana, in the southern United States. And some blood was found on one of the suspect's coats that was also shown to have ma the malaria pigment. pigment. I think you mentioned in your introduction that malaria all produces pigment. Right. No, they didn't know what caused the malaria. They did know that people with malaria, there was this strange brown substance in their blood. And so they were able to show that the blood on the suspect's coat had the malaria pigment and that the, uh, the victim had malaria in his blood and blood stains in the area of the store also contained the malaria pigment. So nowadays, circumstantial at best, but at that time, it was one of the key pieces of evidence that brought about a conviction. This, the fellow that gave this evidence, his name was Joseph Jones, and he came very, very close to discovering the cause of malaria. And also at a different time in his career, he came very, very close to discovering the cause of hookworm disease. But in both cases, he just, he didn't have that serendipity moment. So <laughs> he's, a, he's an interesting fellow. Yeah. Poor guy. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Rosemary. That was a, that was a very interesting story. And I, I want to thank you again for um, all your vast knowledge in parasitology. And I appreciate you talking to me today. My pleasure as always.